Okay, can you start sharing? Do you hear yes. me? Yes, Great. I do. Yes, please start sharing and. <clears throat> Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, no, we see you, but not the screen. How about now? Uh, yes, now we see. Okay, just a, okay. Just a second. So, Professor Masseri will talk about uh, no local Monte Carlo moves with algorithmic quantum and thermal fluctuations. Just a second, I will start. Recording in progress. Okay, please. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to present this talk, and I apologize for not being able to attend in person. I'm going to um, present uh, a, a, a new class of quantum uh, and classical Monte Carlo techniques that uh, rely on algorithmic or inhomogeneous quantum and thermal fluctuations. So there's a history of um, physics-inspired heuristics that uh, have been applied to optimization sampling. This starts from original uh, metropolis hasting algorithm, uh, simulated annealing, and uh, Hopfit model, Boltzmann machine, machine learning, uh, and uh, various techniques in uh, tackling uh, optimization for and sampling for continuous uh, variables like Hamilton and Monte Carlo. Uh, and all the way to parallel tempering, server propagation, and uh, influence from quantum mechanics, uh, invention of quantum annealing. There are new insights in non equilibrium magnetic physics that I think it's going to be important to develop a new class of quantum inspired optimization and hybrid quantum classical optimization and sampling, which I'm going to discuss today. So, what is the main problem with all these techniques is that generally the, the mixing time of local equilibrium Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling is exponential in worst case. And this has been an open problem for decades and huge, uh, people basically assume that this is just a fact that we have to deal with it. And I'm going to challenge that notion today and saying like if you become violent uh, either local or uh, equilibrium assumption, we might be able to basically create shortcut in the uh, dynamics of the Markov chain Monte Carlo and arrive at a steady state much faster. So um, I'm going to present the results that we have uh, obtained recently on a class of quantum inspired algorithms. Um, there are two techniques that we introduced in this work. Basically, we have an adaptive gradient-free strategy that can learn key instance-wise geometrical feature of the cost function and use that information on the fly to create uh, cluster moves in the configuration space. And basically avoiding this kind of uh, inevitable exploration versus expo exploitation trade-offs. So what is the intuition behind our algorithm? Um, so I guess in this audience, you are all familiar with this uh, cartoon of a one dimensional picture of objective function versus a solution space that could have this rugged landscape. And you can use various techniques uh, using basically dissipation or thermal scape in, in various uh, algorithms like a simulated annealing or higher tempering to, to get to some fairly good quality solutions, but uh, it's uh, usually the case for really hard problems that you get stuck in some local minima. And the idea of using quantum fluctuations to basically tunnel in this uh, configuration space has been uh, introduced by Nishimori, and then later on within the adiabatic quantum computing community and uh, Eddie Farhi, Daniel Lidar, and uh, others uh, push this uh, line of research. So I'm going to discuss here a possibility that we can do this classically, actually, and uh, or even build hybrid quantum classical algorithm. 
So I should mention that here in this work, I consider the energy function to involve all other, uh, like uh, uh, not only quadratic terms of interactions of variables. So variables here are um, uh, binary, but uh, the general algorithm can be applied to any discrete uh, set of uh, problems. And it could involve uh, k-local interactions. Uh, so the inputs are the real parameters given by hi and gijs and we want to find the beta string that minimizes this cost function. So um, I'm going to mostly present a cartoon of the algorithm, but uh, have some equations for people who want to see a little bit more details. Um, and so let's start. So what is this kind of this new step? Our, our algorithm basically is, uh, starts with running an off-the-shelf server for a while to get a local minimum, like assume this kind of red dot here. Do you see my cursor? Yeah. On a yes, screen? yes, yes. Yeah, great. So, and the idea is to get some ground state or some high quality state that is far away. Usually people, when uh, this happens, they basically uh, push the panic button. Oh, we have a problem that, you know, basically we are not making progress in a low energy, uh, low temperature replica, for example, in power tempering, so let's boost the energy uh, temperature. And as you boost the temperature, the energy landscape gets flatter and flatter. So you, you obtain exploration by losing all the information you already had in the replica. So you lose uh, everything you had because by increasing temperature everywhere, you, you have, you know, in uh, ideal, uh, you know, in uh, extreme cases of infinite temperature, you can just fly everywhere, but you have no information about the configuration landscape anymore, or very little. So this is not what we are going to do here. So what we are doing here is that once we get localized in a Bayesian attraction here, uh, for example, given by this red dot, we want to, uh, instead of try to desperately to just get out of this with some, you know, uh, one size fits all technique, like just increasing temperature everywhere. We just want to understand what is wrong, why we got stuck here. And in order to do that, we actually, you know, we make the problem more localized. So we add a term to the Hamiltonian, which is proportional to this kind of general lambda linear parameter here. At lambda zero, basically you have original problem which is the, the entire non-convex problem. At lambda infinity, you have just the bit string you obtain, which is given by SS star here. Here, uh, I changed the uh, indexes from S to R to indicate this is the localized replica. And basically what we do is that we, we say that there is sufficiently small lambda uh, that the system becomes basically convex, so you, uh, the, the, the solution to this Hamiltonian, this surrogate Hamiltonian, would be basically in this blue region, which is basically we convexifying this, but it's, it's not too small that you escape this minima, uh, basically this Bayesian attractions. Why we want to extract information about the frozen variable or backbones that are pinning us here, okay? So we have this kind of epsilon i uh, uh, side dependent via scaling as well. We want to make sure that, for for example, for scale-free networks for heavy weight variables that interact with a lot of uh, uh, nodes, we do not uh, reduce the lambda too much so to, to escape from this uh, minimum. So actually, we, in contrast to other things, we want to be localized here. Why? We want to extract information what's what's going on, and we, we do that. Here with loopy belief propagation, but you can use any algorithm that uh, uh, any efficient inference algorithm uh, would do that. So here, uh, loopy belief propagation is just basically uh, is the the field uh, uh, beliefs of uh, that aside j gets from i all the, the neighbors, and given by the local magnetic field, the, the term linear term that we added, and also uh, basically all the messages that goes from the k uh, variables that are the, within the neighborhood of i, which of course is not j, because we want to see the influence of j. And these messages are given basically uh, by gij and this local field themselves. So you have to 
solve this pair of equations. So we do actually an adiabatic loopy belief propagation. So loopy means that you know generally belief propagations are exact on three, and uh, uh, basically any um, uh, graph that like beta lattice that has a uh, local uh, tree-like structure that they perform fairly well. But uh, you can apply them to general graph, but they perform very poorly. Here they do well as far as lambda is sufficiently big. So we start from lambda that is very large, so we consider like that becomes like your boundary condition initialization of these uh, equations, and then we just decrease it every time we get to the fixed point of the belief propagation. And we do it until it, come, uh, it breaks down. But once it breaks down, it, the advantage is that it gives you information that you left the Bayesian of attraction. And so then we know that the information, any information after that is unreliable. We go back to the, the last time that is converged, and we calculate uh, local uh, marginalization and higher order interactions, like two point correlation or K local correlation functions. So why we do that? So we believe that this information, if you look at this, it has some very valuable information here. It tells you why the things are not working. It tells you what kind of subsets of variables are frozen because they are gonna have very large local magnetization and they're gonna be correlated with each other. And then we do some thresholding. The thresholding uh, th technique is that basically say if the two-point correlation functions are above certain threshold, we consider them to uh, belong to same uh, basically cluster. So we call these things backbones and I can tell you why. Uh, so basically this is, you know, as a uh, like cartoon considered like these are the six variables here that are frozen, basically have very uh, large local magnetization. And these are the red variables. And the, the other ones are stars or like basically in this patient or attractions, they're, they're floppy. They can, uh, they, they can have any, any uh, things and it, you are still there. You are not moving out of this patient of attractions. So, uh, one thing about the language when I say here backbones, we, we, we actually mean a surrogate backbone because the, the backbone is actually a notion is used in the spring glass community and uh, graph uh, theory is that uh, a set of variables that all have the same uh, value in the, all the solutions, so they generate solutions. Here, what we mean is, is a surrogate backbone is that all variables that almost have uh, the same value over all high quality solutions in a given Bayesian of attractions. So these are the backbone of a given Bayesian of attractions, not the, the global solution. Uh, so what kind of uh, value you get from this calculation is that what it does that first notice that this is on the fly instance wise. So you, you, you calculate the backbone of a given instance uh, on the fly when you're stuck in the Bayesian attraction. So one thing that you can think uh, to, to actually do is to flip all these variables, saying like if these are frozen here, maybe, and you know, a, a simple simulated annealing or any multicolor techniques that you, you just flip one variable, it gets always rejected because the, the penalty, energy penalty is too much. So maybe you should just move all of them at once. And this is kind of a quantum squared move. You can do this, but most of the time, this is not gonna end up well because you're gonna uh, boost, like, you know, go to a much higher energy. Definitely, you're gonna be very different uh, points in the configuration space. So you're absolutely doing a non-local move. But it might be a lot of work to get done in that new version of attractions, and it's not clear that even it has better minima in general, unless you do, if you have a Z2 symmetry, this works really well, but what we ended up doing, we, we use this mechanism, but in conjunction with uh, uh, something else. So this is the second key uh, idea here in this work, is that we actually say, if there are a subset of variables that are pinning us in that version of attractions, why not just increase temperature over that subset? Because it like, means that they are actually operating at different time energy scales, basically. They're exponentially slower. These are, basically uh, related to size of droplet excitation in, uh, for low dimension spin glasses as well. So this is known that you, know, you are basically bound to the dynamics of these uh, backbones. So we're just uh, making it faster, basically uh, fast forwarding the dynamics of only the subset. But why, 
once you do that, basically you're essentially flattening the energy barrier that's separating you from uh, like the other uh, local minima that might be better. And if you do that, then you can start the algorithm again. You say, okay, now I'm getting stuck in a new vision of attractions. You run the algorithm again, and you find a new backbone, and then you increase the temperature over that backbone. And hopefully after a while, you get to a ground state or a much higher quality of states in approximation ratio. So, in, in, so to look at the high level uh, version of algorithm, so you have a, a parallel tempering uh, a backbone algorithm, this big baseline algorithm, which is, uh, these are different replicas at different temperatures. So this, uh, the red one is the highest temperature and you have a stack of them. At each fixed replica, like a fixed temperature, you run an MCMC sampling, you find a seed solution. Using that seed solution, you add that penalty term to the Hamiltonian to be the local surrogate problem and you do an efficient approximate inference. Uh, we, here we use loop hybrid propagation because uh, uh, they have by construction linear scaling and uh, also it gives you a signal whenever you left that version of attraction which is we really need to do to get a meaningful information about the backbones. And then you grow up backbones using the calculation of higher uh, order marginals and once you do that, you can boost the temperature inside the backbone, basically, and fixing all the variables outside the backbone or non-backbone variables. And uh, once you sample that for a while, and then you fix the backbone and sample the rest. And you can do this iteratively by basically doing uh, inhomogeneous sampling. Inhomogeneous means that the temperature is not uniform everywhere. For simplicity, you can consider two temperatures inside, a higher temperature inside backbone and lower outside backbone. But this can be more uh, complicated. This uh, schedule, I'm gonna discuss uh, some of example of that later. But basically, and uh, still you do the standard replication of Monte Carlo between different temperatures. So this actually, uh, our numeric shows, and it's very easy to see that below spin glass phase transition, these things is more valuable. Above that, you just don't need to do this fancy technique. Uh, so this works well for low temperature replica. So let's go to some of the benchmarking results. Uh, so we, we studied a quite a different sets of problems. We actually started the Chimera, uh, uh, this community motivated from D-Wave architecture. And it did really well for the quasi 2 d but then uh, our goal was to go beyond that because for 2D system, there is this isoenergetic move, ICM moves, or how they are moves that you can actually grow clusters. Uh, and what we ended up uh, studying is that we want to do the hardest problem that are possible. And as you know, random case ads are the test bed of computational complexity. So we studied four sad problems uh, and also random QAP uh, and in some industrial quadratic assignment problem. So, uh, I'm gonna focus here on the random foresight problems that are uh, well studied for decades. So the limitations of both generic and dedicated uh, solvers are well known. So you can see if you are actually doing something non-trivial here or not. Uh, so one thing, the first thing we did is that we studied it against Voxan, which is a generic uh, solver, uh, generic stochastic solver for KSAT, and uh, for random instances, 100 instances of foresight, a near computational phase transition. So these are uh, uh, the size of uh, problems for 5,000. Uh, the ratio of clauses to variable was close to 10, which is pretty deep into the rigidity phase. Uh, th that means that almost like each variable has uh, 10 connections and uh, that the instances for foresight have, uh, at, on the typical instances are very hard, have first order phase transition. Uh, we index here by the so-called complexities that based on server propagation, you can calculate the number of uh, basically um, clusters in the, uh, of the solutions that you could have. And uh, so the, the fewer you have, the, it's a harder problem. Uh, and we studied this and we, we observed that we have almost two order magnitude improvement over Voxa. In worse performance of our solver over 50 repetition would uh, 
do better than the best works out. So actually here, this data is for four, but we, we repeated uh, for many repetitions to see if, the, if we have worst case performance, but it's always we are in the basically single digit violations of clauses. So this is the vertical axis in logarithmic scale is how many violations you have. And uh, here there are on, on the order of 50,000 uh, clauses and basically violations of uh, single digit is like a, around 10 to minus four approximation ratio. So here the result uh, comparison with server propagation, which is the dedicated server for KSAT developed by Parisi, Mark Mazard, and other co-workers. Uh, and this uh, solver is known uh, to perform, this the best solver for uh, this. We have, there's another variant is the backtracking server propagation that we also benchmark. Uh, and we, in both cases, we obtain orders of magnitude improvement for like top 10 worst instances. And uh, here for, this is just four repetitions of this non-equilibrium Monte Carlo. For 95% of instances, we did better at 10 to minus, 10 to nine uh, number of sieves. Um, so comparing it with the, like a local stochastic algorithm, uh, we benchmark taking is adaptive power tempering. This adaptive power tempering is really optimized. We benchmark, we tried it on various different problems, solved like quadratic assignment problems on the order of thousands of binary variables in a fraction of a second. But here you can see that uh, this is struggling to solve uh, problems, uh, this uh, foresight problems. So the performance of non-local strategy increases compared to the local strategy. And as, as you increase the number of sweeps, for example, at 10 to nine, we solve 50% of instances more into 10 to minus four approximation ratio. So to summarize here in this part of the talk is that we develop a technique that actually can learn geometrical features of a cost function in an instance by fashion and uh, invoke non-local cluster updates. This is, uh, and we observed order of magnitude improvement versus generic and specialized solver for approximating uh, random case out problem near computational phase transition. So I, I wanna here emphasize that, you know, as you increase the clauses to variable for a case out problem, uh, when you're under constraints, so basically there are fewer clauses, much fewer clauses than uh, variables, you have basically a single, this is uh, like a, a cartoon or in solution space that you can see that in that regime, uh, it's completely satisfied and it's very easy. You have a single giant like connected uh, solution. It's basically convex. If you add more clauses, you get to this kind of clustering phase transition and you, you have a lot of different solution version of attractions, but there are exponential number of them and it's very easy to find one of them. Uh, if you add more clauses to get to this condensation phase transition, you have fewer of them, but it's still easy because uh, still these are liquid, basically, uh, clusters. You can move from one to another, they are connected. If you add more clauses, you get to this rigidity phase transition. And here, deep into this uh, trans uh, re regime, as you add more clauses, before sad to unsat phase transition, here, uh, this is something known as overlap gap properties, where the distances between uh, division of attractions are uh, larger than the, the bits of this. So when this overlap gap properties holds, that's known, it's recently proved that the, uh, any uh, local strategy that is basically insensitive to the inputs, so that in includes simulated and impaired tempering and in, in quantum like uh, QAOA is in that class. These are insensitive, so they have this concentration and they are uh, basically, they don't see the geometry of various uh, geometrical features of instances and they cannot perform well. And this is in, in, including in server propagation as well in deterministic ca category. Uh, basically, they, they, they have linear scaling, but they fail to penetrate this. And we, we have evidence that now we penetrated into this space of solving some of these instances. Of course, you know, that doesn't mean that you, you solve the uh, worst cases. You, there's always uh, an entropic barrier that is beyond this. 
even if you can identify all the backbones, basically there's just too, ma too many directions. Uh, even if you're flattening the energy landscape, uh, still uh, you have to find the right direction in a high dimensional system, it could be uh, exponentially hot. So what does this mean for quantum computing community and quantum annealing in particular? Does it mean that it's harder to perform, uh, like a, a observe uh, quantum uh, speed up? Uh, and uh, in a way, yes, if you want to compare a benchmark against a standalone quantum solver. But if you create hybrid quantum classical solver, it's actually I believe that actually you can do better than any ind individual quantum classical techniques. So to illustrate this, uh, I want to uh, show you in this the same uh, uh, 1D uh, plot of objective function versus configuration space that you can see like a, like a simple uh, local sampler, you can find this different vision of attractions. These are the purple region here. As uh, you imp improve this kind of classical techniques with these non-local moves, you end up in new version of attractions like uh, that are uh, inaccessible basically with the off the shelf solver. But some of this could have a facing a quantum prone barrier, something that is uh, better to involve quantum fluctuation. And that the, like basically the, color, the interplay of these non-local classical and quantum moves have uh, you know, increased your uh, ergodicity in the configuration space. So how do you do it in the, the, the overall uh, scheme of this algorithm is that as you have a paratemporary uh, baseline algorithm and you do this kind of uh, MCMC sampling at that temperature, you find solutions, again, building surrogate Hamiltonian, doing approximate inference, growing the backbone. Now, instead of doing this inhomogeneous thermal fluctuations, for some of these backbones that are very hard and it seems that they don't have their own uh, structure. So you, you can do this hierarchically. In each backbone, there could be another backbone, of course. But some of them have no structure, and you can see that the quantum fluctuation can give you uh, better diffusion. Uh, uh, basically, you could see a quadratic speed up on uh, using that hot start. And uh, so you see uh, Bayesian attractions that are uh, inaccessible otherwise. But also this does something interesting. It, it, it acts as a subgraph selection, sub 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 selection for like just like quantum solver. First, that notice that it can reduce the sizes. A backbone could be an uh, order of magnitude smaller number of variables. And also reduce the dimensionality of the graph, like the graph connectivity. And so the embedding uh, becomes much uh, easier task to do. Uh, so it becomes an effectively could be 2D or even 1D backbone, which, uh, could be easier to uh, implement in a, like a, a NIST device or a, a quantum annealer. So basically, uh, this could be uh, like a technique for uh, various different uh, subgraph selection when uh, your problem input is just too big. So what kind of quantum uh, techniques can be uh, used here? So I'm gonna um, uh, highlight one general techniques that uh, we developed over the past few years with my collaborators, Mark Ram and Adolfo uh, and others uh, that we use this kind of inhomogeneous quantum annealing protocols. And uh, we have a recent work that we show that how these uh, techniques can lead to a, you know, sampling a diverse set of solutions. So the notion of diversity here is important. It's, that it's not important only when you go to the sampling to the, it's not only important to get just one good solution. You, you want to get different solutions of different flavors with large you know, distance to the original uh, solution that you have. So we have this parity order parameter that characterizes the overlap of two basically solutions uh, over n variables. But this is a 1D projections of the, what's happening. So first, uh, at low temperatures, it's featureless, but also it, it just, it cannot distinguish as if you have two dominating vision attractions or 10 or 20. It, it, this, this is insensitive to that kind of information. If they like, uh, basically the droplet excitation have the same volume. So if you consider ground state that like this is for 2D system, uh, like having various uh, bit string with like a uh, white and black denoting a spin up and down, you can see that there are 
for single excitation, there are various different droplet uh, of uh, variables that you can flip to get to the uh, degenerate single excitation. This is with an approximation ratio of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.001. And they are very different in flavor, but they don't, they give you similar cues. Uh, so we need to get to this kind of level to, to see what, uh, what are like characteristics of solver. If you want to even benchmark solver, this could be a good indicator, uh, a new way of uh, creating, uh, uh, distinguishing performance of various solver. So we introduced this diversity measure. Basically, it's this estimating the set of low energy states uh, for a given approximation ratio. Let's assume that we can do that. The diversity measure is based on uh, some distance measure between two solutions. Like uh, we use Hamming distance. Uh, we do a connected Hamming distance. Basically, uh, the Hamming distance that is based on a, a set of uh, variables that are connected with, you, with each other. Basically, this is inspired from the drop droplet excitations of uh, low dimension spin glasses. But uh, it's also related to the notion of back ones I introduced earlier. So we say that if this is distance is larger than some renormalized uh, uh, distance threshold, basically say n over four or n over eight, it becomes increasingly unlikely that uh, these solutions are belonging to the same region of attractions. Of course, this is not, uh, uh, always the case, you know, there could be connections uh, between far away uh, digital attractions, basically when they are connected uh, uh, with, you know, only local moves, but that just becomes unlikely as you increase this R. So if you build a graph, which each vertex is a high quality solution, and you just truncate the edges uh, correspond to distances larger than Rn, the cardinality of, uh, uh, of maximally independent set over that graph tells you uh, basically how diverse are the solution. And you can introduce uh, a diversity ratio in, uh, similar to an approximation ratio, saying that the di diversity of a particular solver given by this uh, condition over the diversity of all solver combined, or if you have a, a solver to uh, approximate way of uh, calculating the diversity, you can use a, some greedy algorithms. You can see what a performance of this solver is in contrast uh, to basically uh, to approximation ratio, which doesn't give you any information about how different the solutions that uh, you are obtaining. You might just uh, there might be just one region of attractions with very big support that your solver finds, and it's very deep, but always you get that. So, and other solver could have many different region of attractions. So you, there's no way that approximation ratio give you that information. So we tested this with this kind of benchmarking homogeneous versus inhomogeneous schedules. Why? Because the inhomogeneous can have with, with their envelopes, like basically the way that you do it is that you have thermal uh, quantum fluctuations to basically start at certain variables and uh, what have a space time profile is that they propagate this critical front from one uh, point, could be from one end of linear chain, for example, or from the middle and basically propagate to uh, all uh, variables in some uh, uh, function that is given, uh, characterized by this J, G function which is both time and uh, space dependent. So there is some argument based on causalities that uh, basically uh, if you do this, because uh, the variables that are not experiencing phase transition already get influenced by the, uh, the ones that are already D, they act basically as local field biases to them. So it's unlikely that they violate that. So basically you get uh, suppressing uh, emergence of topological defects. This is actually emerged from like uh, studies of Gibbons rate mechanism uh, for uh, continuous phase transition. Um, pioneering by uh, uh, Mark Rams and Adolfo and uh, Zurich himself. So um, recently we developed a multi-front uh, 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 version of this is that instead of having a single critical front, 
how about just starting at very di very different positions like that uh, uh, you start the critical fronts and they merge at some boundaries of course this could be only effective if you have some insight so you should have a hack of what basically these drop like excitations are for 2d actually it's we develop an approximate tensor network contraction basically based on an mps mpo uh, or you could you could use corner transfer matrix uh, techniques to to uh, to have efficient uh, basically a tensor network contraction to get uh, an, uh, the basically boundaries of these droplets. Of course, this for 2D system gives you uh, more than that, but we use only the information about the boundaries and we, do, we basically uh, trigger the seeds of these critical fronts in the middle of these uh, droplets. And we basically did uh, in homogeneous quantum annealing, we use this quantum Monte Carlo to to do the simulations, uh, we did two, two different cases of uh, 30 by 30 lattice and 40 by 40. Uh, uh, and we basically tried to see how much works we need to do to some, to get a good diversity ratio from basically zero to one. And this is the vertical axis is time to solution, uh, time to di diversity for this. Uh, in uh, different order of magnitudes here, uh, above 10 to nine we consider timeout. And you can see that the performance increased by 30 to 40 percent in the diversity for both like 50 percent median and uh, 80 percent quantile that the inhomogeneous uh, timeout much later basically can sample from 50 to 75 percent or uh, going from uh, 50 to close to 90 percent of diversity compared to the baseline uh, simple homogeneous schedule. So uh, the, we did some experiment on DWAVE uh, on this and that uh, with uh, Alex, uh, Hussein and Mohammed, uh, which is you can um, uh, look at that paper. I, I'm not sure if there's a poster or a talk on that, but Marek uh, give a talk on Wednesday at 11, I guess, on uh, this diversity measure techniques. Uh, if you like to see more details, please attend that talk. So basically, with the combination of quantum classical fluctuation, we can see more uh, uh, of uh, like unaccessible version of attractions in the frozen regime than possibly you can do with the either classical or quantum. Um, and once we do that, basically the ultimate kind of product would be uh, to uh, offer it, for example, on a, a cloud-based system like a, a Google Cloud Platform, for example, that you have a higher tempering baseline algorithm and in low temperature replica, you can invoke uh, uh, various different non-local move either uh, by some classical processor that does, you know, it could be a ASIC dedicated processor or an Ising machine or a quantum processor. So they can all combine like a new ideas of non-local move and basically, uh, you have to uh, basically work these systems. I think these are the ultimate best uh, discrete optimization sampling system that are going to be developing in the next few years. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Masood. Other questions? Questions. The, the, I think there was a question also in the chat. Let me start from that. <clears throat> So from the chat, uh, Catherine was asking, are these four SAT instances generated at hard critical point in close to variable ratio? Yeah, so they are generated deep into the frozen regime based on the estimations from server propagation. Yes, they are uh, very close to competition phase transition. What we wanted to be just into the uh, SAT regime, so uh, the uh, so there, there are at least some of them are going to be satisfied in at thermodynamic limits if they were like large enough in principle uh, before sat to onset phase transition which is around 9.98 uh, that that would be all, all of them should be satisfied but because this is finite size effect so some of them uh, are not even satisfied although they are in sat regime but they're very close to that Yes. 
Thank you for the talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, is there any reason why the inhomogeneous uh, Markov chain that you build within the replicas should converge? Because I feel like data balance should break down there. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we are actually having a follow-up work that we show that although this does not satisfy data balance, actually that's the reason we call it non-equilibrium Monte Carlo, is that uh, it uh, arrives at a steady state. Uh, and I can give you an uh, idea why that's the case. Basically, um, notice that the way we do it is that we are not really having this kind of crazy, uh, like uh, non-local move that we flip all the bits at simultaneously. We have this boosted uh, thermal fluctuation within a backbone. And once you do that, basically, uh, if you freeze the non-backbone variables, it's just a standard MCMC at high temperature over a subgraph, and it satisfies detailed balance, okay? And once you get to a better, like a local minimum, basically of uh, the backbones, you freeze that and you just sample a standard MCMC itself. And that's also satisfied detail balance. So basically, in, in, you can think about a very, uh, wherever you froze the backbones and you're just sampling the rest, it's just a convex problem. You, you are in a Bayesian of attractions. If your uh, estimation of the backbones are uh, conservative enough, basically that lambda is uh, sufficiently big, you are gonna just like do a, a, a simple sampling in a Bayesian of attractions and satisfying detail balance there. And once you freeze the non-backbone variables, you just uh, satisfying detail balance with uh, sampling a subgraph, okay? So the combination works. The, we have a construction that show that this is actually the case or, or uh, uh, more rigorously uh, in a follow-up work. Basically, yeah, there is a steady says numerically we were robust uh, across the board for all the instances we tried. Uh, and it's basically verified. Uh, but I think you, can, you got the idea that basically you satisfy detailed balance between, uh, in the non-local move when you're like, focusing on the backbone and you're also satisfying detailed balance when you're also, uh, you know, just uh, trying to do exploitation in a given Bayesian attraction. I see, I see, thanks. My second question is, when you are comparing adapt adaptative parallel tempering with non-equilibrium Monte Carlo, you look at the number of Monte Carlo states, but it seems to me that you are not, first of all, considering the time it takes for you to have the, your local solution before starting non-equilibrium Monte Carlo, and then you, you don't consider the time, it, the time it takes for you to build your localized circuit problem and to grow the backbone, right? So if you include those time, you think that maybe if you increase those time for ad adaptive parallel tempering, maybe you might catch up with NMC. Uh, no, no, we include those time. So basically, it's a good question. You know, you're saying that there is a computational overhead, even if you have like uh, algorithmic scaling that is favorable uh, because flip propagation is just has a linear scaling the number of parameters involved. But the, the thing is that it's still it's, it takes some work to do this. Uh, usually in our experiences was like a few percent between five to 10% overhead of the LBP. And if you add these things to uh, adaptive prior tempering, when you are hitting an exponential barriers, these things don't matter. 5% uh, more time, you, yeah, you absolutely obtain no better solutions. So prior tempering, when things get really stark, you know, you can improve the number, you can increase the number of sweeps by order of magnitudes, it's not gonna do much. So. Uh, if you are really touching, obtaining information about backbone, it's worth every penny to, to, to actually find out and do this technique. So in our experience, that the overhead was not a big deal. Okay, so thank you for the, the nice and, thank you for the nice and interesting presentation. And uh, so as for the non-local update, so I suppose that the proposed NMC algorithm so requires additional computational time. So actually, so I was wondering, so is there so any benchmark of the time to solution, so compared with the naive simulated annealing or naive parallel tempering method? So I, are you asking like if, uh, so to obtain uh, basically, like uh, calculating lower bonds on these things, these are heuristic, it's very hard. Uh, still, we don't have any, any uh, I think, general results to even compare like uh, uh, paratempering versus simulated annealing or uh, quantum annealing versus uh, simulated annealing. Generally, uh, obtaining like performance guarantee over the uh, worst solution. Um, 
we don't have that. And I don't think that's actually the right way of thinking about it. Because, you know, I have this general objection to this kind of people who are, uh, you know, they think it's really great to pr prove uh, uh, the worst case performance. Generally, whenever you do that, it implies that your algorithm is kind of has a brute force nature. Otherwise, how do you know that like in worst case you have that performance? Basically in branch and bond techniques, you have to just like exhaustively look at every other branches to, to know what the worst case performance is. Here we cannot do that. It's like, a, it, this is a heuristic. So, uh, as, and, and then you need to benchmark it. Hey, Masood, uh, very nice talk. Um, I have a, a question and, and a comment. Uh, so, um, the question is, is uh, it seems like you are kind of uh, driving a, a stake through the heart of quantum annealing by uh, proposing that, that tunneling is something that we can mimic classically. Uh, we don't really need to do quantum tunneling. Right? We, can, we, we, we can, in fact, quantum tunneling takes exponential time and the width of the barrier and so on. And we can just cleverly uh, circumvent that using uh, your very nice classical move. Is that the right way to think about it? Uh, in many cases, yes, not all cases. Like, I don't say as a, a last part of my talk, I was saying that uh, I think um, the combination of quantum classical could do better. And I, I can tell you an example of why that's the case. So imagine you have a backbone that you find and has no particular structure. And you, you can do a classical and assume it's just 1D, uh, like a very low dimensional. Uh, backbone, you can basically, once you do this kind of increase, increase the temperature over there, you're going to do really faster, much faster than a standard high tempering. But it doesn't mean that you, the classical fluctuation is the best to do. Because if you do a quantum walk, basically if it's like an honest structure backbone, a quantum diffusion has this kind of quadratically faster uh, diffusion compared to classical. I think Santoro actually has a result on this that shows like uh, in general, compared to uh, 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 stochastic diffusion classically and quantum, there is a quadratic separation. So you can see that you can sample the backbone much faster quantum mechanically, in, uh, at least in absence of any other underlying structure. So here you have to notice that the, this is like appreciate that here we're just saying that there is some underlying hidden symmetries that people don't see it when once you get to this so-called spinglass phase transition that might be a, you know, one might be able to compute and exploit it to basically uh, get out of uh, a spinglass phase. But it doesn't tell you that getting out of it is always the best to do classically. It's that like the, the core things is that once you find the subgraphs, that are the computational bottleneck, a still quantum advantage could be observed over the subgraphs. Okay. Um, and then uh, a comment. So we had a paper uh, last year on um, benchmarking three XOR set uh, for many different type of heuristic algorithms, including uh, quantum kneeling, but um, the state-of-the-art classical approaches. Uh, the winner in, in that benchmark was uh, Parisi et al.'s uh, sat on GPU. Um, don't know if you're familiar with it, but they, uh, they have a, uh, an, an excellent, uh, highly specialized algorithm uh, running on clusters. Uh, so uh, I, I, can, I can send you the reference to that, but I'd be very, very interested to see the performance of uh, your new algorithm uh, on that benchmark. Uh, the sat on GPU and, and also the uh, Fujitsu digital annealer uh, was very close. Uh, those were the, the two best algorithms there. So, uh, as I mentioned, that I, I believe that uh, against any algorithm that are local, uh, and uh, this means that all classes of prior tempering that we know, including the most, you know, we have very efficient uh, implementation. Uh, this is actually, uh, you know, something that uh, uh, developed by Sergei Isakov, we improved it by 40%. We have adapted a strategy that is way faster. So in the probabilistic algorithms, uh, we, we actually benchmarked it very rigorously against the best uh, in the class. 
And against the deterministic, we worked with Parisi team, uh, like basically Federico, Ricci, Trezenki, and Rafael. Uh, they are actually closer on these things, and they, they run uh, various versions of uh, server propagation, uh, backtracking server propagation. I, I don't know the, the particular uh, algorithm you, are, you use in your benchmark, uh, but we, we can talk about it and uh, see if you can uh, benchmark against those problems. But I, I, generally, I'm saying that any a strategy is that uh, uh, local would not be able to penetrate to this uh, so-called overlap gap uh, in the problems that have overlap gap properties, uh, fragmented uh, solution space. If you are in that fragmented solution space, uh, things are believed to be exponentially hard if you are local and you are insensitive to the input. So the things that this algorithm is sense, you know, I, I just really want to emphasize, I think future of like optimization is like you have to have sense sensitivity to the input. It means that for each instance, you should do different. And ensemble averaging is basically any technique that has concentration. I think it's just not clever enough. It's not sophisticated enough. Because this shortcut, this information about uh, this uh, geometry of land, uh, energy, uh, Landscape is going to average all. Like it's going, it's, it's going to be nil, nothing. If you do any disorder averaging. Other questions? <clears throat> um, thanks for the talk. I actually have a very naive question that I had been wondering since the very beginning of the talk. What exactly are these backbones? At so how does they really relate to the fragmentation? Sorry, uh, how does it relate to? The fragmentation. Oh, the fragmentation in the solution space. So basically, you know, the backbones are, you, you can consider they're just a set of variables that give you the address to a Bayesian attraction. The address means that if you fix those variables, to that kind of either up or down, at like as, uh, it's just a bit of string over soft ground. If you fix that, uh, they, they just uh, give you the like a location of a uh, version of attractions. The rest of variables that are floppy are the degrees of freedom that gives you various different points in that version of attractions. So why that's the general feature is that uh, it, it is like the, no matter how you label it, you know, you can say like the first variables, if it is zero or one, it can split the configuration space in half. So that gives you an address if you are in the first half of configuration space or second half. So you can see like if the first 10 spins gives you an address. But the generally, the idea is that um, uh, the finding the clusters that are conspired together to, to trap you in a vision of attractions, it's an extremely difficult thing. So I should emphasize that we did this work on an unweighted uh, foresight, which was no information to Hamiltonian. Basically, it's a random foresight, they were unweighted. So in the description of the problem itself, is like a white nose. There's no information at all to the role of a cluster. The, the information is solution space in this fragmented or uh, uh, shattered solution space is that those uh, disjoint or uh, the gap between the solutions, which we introduced this diversity measure to capture it, gives you an idea of where, what basically um, the features of this are. Of course, you know, finding exact backbones for all these patient attractions is a sharp, hard problem. Not only that you have to solve like the problem, you have to find all these good quality solutions and that's just, uh, not possible in polynomial time. But we get an idea, a cartoon, or like a shadow of the backbone efficiently with like a, something that is linear in time. And that's good enough to create the shortcut in the configuration space. That's the idea. I, I don't know if I answered the questions. Like these are basically, you know, saying what are the backbones or like subset of variables that gives you an, uh, the address of this kind of a, a, a particular shadow uh, uh, cluster of solutions in the configuration space. I have a question. Um, so 
So there's an intuition that says that if you sample, you do a sample widely over a bunch of local minima, then the backbone of those local minima is the good part, the part you're supposed to keep because it's what they all have in common that make them local. But you're sampling from a local minima and the backbone is the bad part that, that is keeping you stuck there. And so I, I guess I'm wondering if, if, if sometimes backbones are good and sometimes backbones are bad and how one would tell the difference. Oh, okay, so there's two things. Like uh, these are, you know, as I said, there are surrogate backbones of like, of like various different high quality solutions, like local minimals that you find. The, the the backbone in the traditional, like the standard notion, is it's the set of variables that uh, uh, are cons consistent within all the solutions. So if you find them, basically you're done. The rest of problem, uh, basically this creates a backdoor in the like a. Dedicated SAT solver, uh, this is called like, uh, you know, finding backdoors of a problem. It means that by fixing this, you're truncating in the like branch of one technique of, uh, you know, things that you're truncating the uh, uh, decision tree and uh, you, you only, sample, you are basically in your right branch and whatever you do is gonna be good. But finding that particular backbone that corresponds to the uh, ground state or uh, degenerate ground state is like very hard. So here, what I'm saying is that the other backbones or other backbones correspond to the other version of attractions. And those, if you discover them, basically they're conspiring against you to keep you local. And once you sample over those backbones, you might end up in the correct version of attractions that those degenerate ground states are. So basically here, I define backbones more generic for any, uh, uh, like a deep uh, valley in the configuration space. Uh, and it could be one of them is like has the generic solution, but I think solution is always within a target approximation ratio. So if you have like something beyond ground states, very likely you have multiple Bayesian attractions for in having distance that are satisfied. So basically there is not a backbone that is good. You have to just find the ones that, you know, have, they're deep enough that you penetrate to the target approximation ratio. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? One more. So uh, when we started about percolation theory, I actually uh, came across a concept that you are actually fusing this kind of cluster so that you come to the global minimum. So that concept is quite clear to me, but I don't really know why are you really fragmenting the clusters into smaller cross clusters that has got local minima. Uh, you, you, you don't need to do that. It's, it's the, there are various versions of uh, how you can use that information. Basically, you can co consider two tier, um, like, a, or you know, first tier uh, of this algorithm is just you. Um, you discover things either they are belong to one of the surrogate backbones or they are not. So, uh, but you have to consider that this is an algorithm uh, that is uh, recursive, but it's also online. Basically, at each point in the, conf uh, uh, you know, when you're running the standard MCMC sampler, it, it starts building some uh, uh, model of the, what the configuration energy landscape is. Basically, so you do appro approximate inference on the fly to, to, to extract that information. And then uh, basically, as you do this, you improve your knowledge about these backbones. You can do this in, in different ways to dig deeper into a one backbone, saying like, uh, maybe there are more backbones inside that, that are the bottlenecks. But you don't need to. Basically, it depends on how complex your problem are and how, you know, um, what are your target approximation ratios. It might be that if you don't do that, certain target approximation ratio are inaccessible because although you find a backbone, but the backbone has a structure itself. I should tell you, size of backbones could be really big. For four sand, like 5,000 variables, we find frozen backbone of on the order of 4,000 and we show using whitening procedure that Paris actually developed, that 
you can uh, show that these are frozen variables of that size. So we, we have a, a generalization of that, you know, white chain procedure for low energy states. It's originally introduced for only the solutions. But it, it never gives you a false signal. So basically it tells you whenever there, you have a frozen, absolutely frozen variable. And we show that adaptive parallel temping cannot get to any of these things uh, with even thousands of repetitions. So it's not like a, based on some law. So like you cannot just get lucky by you know, finding this, these things that are so far away with large backbones. So a backbones of 4,000 is still almost the same size as the original problem. It could be hard. But that, that's basically your new sub problem. So you can target that and try to see if there's uh, other backbones inside of it. So, so you can, but here, the result I showed you is just only one time. You know, you're not digging deeper into each of the backbones. And still, we got this performance in the first year of our algorithm. Is that clear? OK. So I think there have been quite a few questions, unless there's anything new. OK. One last. Minor question clarification. So when we uh, talk about uh, solving uh, sad problems better than other algorithms, we mean uh, here in this talk, uh, max sad problems, right? Because for specifically sad, uh, when uh, a problem is uh, satisfiable and we want a solution, there are uh, other algorithms like uh, uh, conflict-based uh, close uh, learning which may be better than the algorithms we are comparing to, like, PTAC. Oh, no, actually, we benchmark against that. Oh, so uh, th uh, thanks for asking this question. So we benchmark against uh, CDCL kind of algorithms. Uh, conflict driven close learning te techniques are more fancy uh, branch and bot solver based on DPLL algorithm, which is basically uh, what it does is that it, it it goes to this kind of uh, each uh, branch of the uh, in, in decision tree, and it just says that whenever there is a conflict, it just mark that, and it's just never visit that branch again. So basically, uh, you you have a, a fairly efficient way of sampling uh, the uh, certain sad problems, but not in this regime. This is the regime that they actually have exponential running time. We we tried. Top of best algorithm in SAT solving competitions uh, in uh, like Minisat and uh, uh, there a few other uh, uh, techniques that they had such bad performance that after months of running, they couldn't even exit on these instances. So they were that hard. In this regime that very close to SAT on SAT things for four SAT, for random foresight, there is no signal for them. They have no clue, basically, where to go. It's, it's exponential, and I can tell you like, why is that. Basically, the, those algorithms perform well if they can truncate fast in each of the branches, so they, they see a lot of branches, but they never get to the depths of it, to the exponential depths of it. And that's just, you do not get a conflict at this closest variable ratio. You just don't. You have to go very deep into the branch. But also, they cannot be like they cannot trunk it. Like basically, they have to just visit each branch and go very deep into it. That's the only way to deal with this force at, the, at this uh, ratio of classes to variable. Uh, but construction, you can see. Look at the Christopher Moore book uh, uh, that it's explained this this very nicely. That why why these algorithms basically uh, when the formula is frozen basically. Uh, as Mo uh, says, you 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 have like this branch and one techniques have no clue what they, what to do. <clears throat> so close to the uh, uh, phase sat on sat phase transition, you are saying that on both sides of that phase transition, the algorithm you are presenting is better for both pro uh, like. It, but if we take the problems which are satisfiable and we want to find the solution and the problems which are close to phase transition but are unsatisfiable and we want to solve max that, right? Yeah, so, but uh, of course you can do max that, you know, uh, 
in, in, in any ratio of closest to variable, if they are so hard, like it's finding, we find that like finding ground state close to Saturn side, although in that thermodynamic limits, they are satisfiable. At any finite size, they might not be satisfiable. Okay, yeah, we believe that close to phase transition on either side will perform better. Uh, uh, strictly, I think the, uh, the algorithms that could do better than us is like similar, they should have sensitivity to the input, okay? I'm saying like, if you don't have sensitivity to inputs, you, you, you are not in science wise, you are not in that game. I think this is like, uh, we, we need to develop these classes of algorithm. I'm not saying this is the best in that class. I'm just saying that it's, it's better than any local strategy that uh, uh, basically uh, it's performed similarly across all inputs. Basically it's not ad adaptable based on data. Okay? Okay, I think it's time to, sorry, take off here. Uh, good, so I think we can uh, um, thank Masoud again for the talk. <laughs> so I, I saw...